Hi, my name is John Goldsmith, and I'd like to talk to you about a book that I just finished reading, and I wrote a review of it as well in this video. It's going to reflect that review, although it's not the same thing. The book is called The Linguistics Wars by uh, Randy Harris. Here it is. It's subtitled Chomsky, Lakoff, and the Battle Over Deep Structure. It's the second edition. The first edition came out in the early 1990s. And this book is revised and, and greatly expanded. It's now, it's a hefty book. It's about 400 pages without the footnotes. So it's a, it's a big book and it's very well written. Randy Harris is a really terrific writer, the likes of which you rarely find among uh, academic writers. So anyway, well written fun to read, a lot of interesting things in it. Randy is a professor of English at the University of Waterloo. He's a, his area is rhetoric, and um, as a rhetorician, he um, takes full advantage of his background to, to look at the rhetoric of, uh, of people engaged in linguistics. The book uh, is focused on a particular moment in linguistics that basically took place in the second half of the 60s. So that's quite a while back. So it focuses on that period, but it's uh, more largely on the rise of generative grammar, focusing on uh, syntax almost exclusively. There's some discussion of semantics, pragmatics, phonology, but primarily looking at syntax. The period at the end of the 60s, second half of the 60s, is a period in which there was a kind of an internecine battle between Chomsky on the one hand and some of his students, most notably Ray Jackendoff. And on the other hand, um, generative semantics, which was in some sense led by a group of four linguists who are often called the four horsemen of generative semantics. And those people were Hadge Ross and George Lakoff, uh, Jim McCauley and Paul Postal. Nonetheless, it's Chomsky who's really at the center of this book, Chomsky in big bright neon letters, um, and there'll be a lot more to say about Chomsky in his book and, and in this review as well. Chomsky is an extraordinary person, as uh, anybody in linguistics knows, and many people who have followed his, his work in, in other domains. He's an extraordinary person, but he's a character, nonetheless, is full of contradictions. It's, he's a man who's both gracious and obstreperous. He's compassionate and contemptuous. He's courageous and acrimonious. He's all of those things, all rolled up in one person. It makes a really interesting story to try to figure out how this is possible and whether all of these uh, statements about him really are true. Now, because this is essentially a review, I, I think I need to tell you whether I think you should read this book. And I don't know anything about you really, except that statistically speaking, you probably don't know too much about linguistics. And I'm going to suggest that, yes, you should read this book. You'll enjoy it. You'll learn a lot about it. I have some questions which I'm going to share with you um, about uh, whether there are some things about linguistics that you're missing out on, if this is what you learn about linguistics. Um, but it's a, it's a really good book. And whether you know a lot about linguistics or a little bit, there's a lot of interesting things that you'll learn by reading this book. When I finished writing the first draft of... Um, of the review of this book, I took the opportunity to, to send it to Randy Harris. Um, I might say, I don't think that's a, a common um, policy among people who write academic reviews, but it's something I've been doing for 30 years or more. I think it's a, a very good thing when you're writing a review to think that the first person who's going to read it is the author of the book you're describing, analyzing, potentially criticizing. And I know in my case that that's exactly what happened. I I uh, tried to think about what Randy's reaction would be. Well, what I think Randy's reactions will be and what his reactions are, of course, completely different. Randy wrote back, made a number of suggestions. I've taken many of them into consideration. I hope that if I say that I have a ton of areas, a ton of points where I don't agree with Randy, you won't take that to mean that in, in, in some sense, uh, I, I think that there was negligence or incompetence on his part. Far from it. I think the disagreement is the seeds of what moves any kind of discussion forward in any kind of disciplinary uh, thought or, or progress. It's, it's always based on disagreement. I think I should say a few words about myself. For those of you who don't know me at all, which almost uh, all of you, I imagine, uh, tell you a bit about my background and my experience because it's relevant to the content of the book we're talking about. Uh, 
I, I knew or, or know uh, most of, almost all of the major characters in this story. The first linguistics meeting I ever went to was in 1970. There was a summer linguistics meeting at um, uh, Ohio State University in Columbus, my first meeting. I was a grad student at MIT from 1972 to 1976, and there I was a student of, of Noam Chomsky, of Morris Halley, Paul Kiparsky, and Hedge Ross. And other people in the story have either been friends or colleagues of mine, um, notably, well, Ray Jack Jackendoff is somebody who I've been friends with since I was a grad student at MIT. Um, Fred Householder, who's a small, small character, but not unimportant in this book, was the first person to interview me and offer me a position. And he was more or less my boss for about eight years when I was a professor at uh, Indiana University, from, which was from 76 to 84. Uh, Jim McCauley was my colleague at the University of Chicago, where I, I moved in 1984, and he was my colleague until he, he passed away some 15 years later. Um, I also wrote a book on the subject of uh, generative semantics and interpretive semantics, along with Jeff Huck, a book that was published uh, in 1995. And I, I might add that Randy cites the book that Jeff and I wrote, uh, Ideology and Linguistic Theory. He cites it a number of times. I'm going to mention one place where he, what he cites is, is important. Um, and I think he does a very good and fair job of, of citing our book. And I mention that because it, it's only natural that my seeing how he cites my work gives me a, a, an ability to calibrate his writing and his research gives me a sense of, of how he does that. And I, I think he did a very good job. George Lakoff is somebody I've known since, well, the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and Paul Postel, although he's someone I don't know well, he is somebody that Jeff Huck and I interviewed at, at some length when we were writing the book about generative semantics and interpretive semantics. So almost all the major characters in this story are people who I know personally to some degree or other. Now, this book is a book like nobody else would write it. Uh, Randy actually uh, attributes personal motives to what a lot of the linguists are doing when they present intellectual positions. And the person who is most subject to this kind of scrutiny is no one other than Noam Chomsky. And over and over again, Randy uh, describes the scene in such a way that Chomsky's actions uh, have a social meaning, which is quite different from what Chomsky says he's, he's doing. And actually, it seems pretty clear that Randy is right most of the time. And so in a certain way, Chomsky's actions are not transparent, perhaps not to himself, and certainly not to the world at large. Chomsky's trying to accomplish things other than what he says he's trying to accomplish. And there are motives to, her, to his writing, which are different from those which he acknowledges. That's the case that Randy tries to make and I have to say, he does a good job. I think it's quite persuasive. And what makes this psychoanalysis even more charged than it might otherwise be is that Chomsky's reputation outside of linguistics is, is firmly based on uh, being a critic of American foreign policy and on his attacks on pundits who are incapable of seeing that while they justify American policy and aggression abroad, they fail to identify the, the true motives of the political actors, and they take the superficial and self-serving descriptions of American motives for the real thing. Now, I, for one, uh, largely agree with Chomsky's political attacks, especially those that he published in the late 1960s, uh, early in his political career, when he really spoke to uh, Americans uh, in the same way that the prophets of the Old Testament did. The prophets of the Old Testament would say uh, to the people of Israel, yes, you may be the chosen people of Jehovah, but that doesn't mean that he's going to judge you by any other standards than the standards that he applies to everybody. You're not going to get an easy pass on things that you do that go against the, the laws of Jehovah. You might think that somebody who... Uh, was able to uh, see beyond the self-serving hypocrisy of defenders of American aggression uh, 
would be able to transfer those abilities to the field of linguistics. Uh, but you would be wrong. And alas, we are all human. Um, and so a great deal of the story that Randy has to tell involves a mismatch between what Chomsky did and, and what he says he did. And obviously it's galling to be subject to such analysis. And it's galling if you're Noam Chomsky or if you're somebody who sympathizes uh, greatly and identifies intellectually that with, um, with Chomsky's position. I mentioned earlier that Randy was not entirely satisfied with the review that I wrote uh, of his book. Uh, and he noted, uh, and I'm going to quote him here, many of the misunderstandings, I believe, stem from you losing sight at times that I'm writing a rhetorical history, a history of appeals, currents of influence, attributions of credibility, uh, argument structure, and the like not a history of technical accomplishments, which is in quotes, uh, or disciplinary truths. Again, truths in quotes. I don't know why they're in quotes. There's some kind of scare quotes. I have a lot of trouble with scare quotes, but that's what he wrote. Now, I'm not at all sure that the project that Randy defines for himself, if that's the way he, he defines it, I'm not at all sure that that can be done I'm not at all sure, let's put it the other way. I am sure that you can't do that, what I just, what he just said, without getting into the concepts and the claims at the deepest scientific level. I'd be happy, in fact, if the review that I wrote and what I'm seeing here could be taken in part as, as part of an argument that you can't just do a rhetorical history. There's just no way to do it. I can understand that it could be someone's goal. You can try to do something that's impossible. That doesn't make it possible. And it's really not clear if you should be judged on the basis of what you want to do or on the basis of what you have done in any event. This is a really important question. Randy uh, goes on to say that the non-rhetorical parts of the history would have to be dealt with by linguists, and I'll take myself to be in that group. And he said, and now I'm quoting, my concern is the process by which these accomplishments and truths are entered into the record where the consensus and the dissensus of the practitioner's forms. What you seem to take as my judgment on linguistic technicalities are rather my judgment on the relation between their cogency and their uptake. Now, I wouldn't use the word technicalities. I don't think I'm concerned with technicalities. I think I'm concerned with research and truth and argumentation and fundamental questions and relationship between the discipline of linguistics and its neighboring disciplines and the like. I think calling those technicalities is, is inaccurate. But in any event, we certainly need to be clear on what Randy uh, thinks that he's doing so we can judge the book in part, understanding what his goals are. I'd like to take a minute and talk about the overall uh, storyline of, of Randy's book. The story begins um, with a young undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania named Noam Chomsky, who's not sure that he really wants to be a college student. And he gets in touch with a very distinguished linguist at the University of Pennsylvania named Zelig Harris. Now, there's no coincidence here, basically. Zelig Harris was uh, a friend of Noam Chomsky's family. Chomsky came from a Jewish community in Philadelphia, and his father, Chomsky's father, was a major scholar of the Hebrew language, and Zelig Harris was a, a major scholar of uh, Semitic languages more, more generally. Chomsky goes and studies with Zelig Harris, is interested both in Zelig's uh, connection to politics and to linguistics. When he graduates from college, uh, along with the assistance and the support of Zelig Harris and the philosopher Nelson Goodman, Chomsky becomes a, a Harvard Junior Fellow, and he spends four years from 1951 to 1955 as a Harvard Junior Fellow, interacting with intellectuals at Harvard, as one can imagine, people like uh, B.F. Skinner and, and Van Quine and, and so forth. Um, he also becomes friends with Morris Halley, who has just finished his PhD working with Roman Jakobsen, who was uh, an important and influential Russian linguist who came to the United States um, during World War II. Chomsky, as I say, was a Harvard Junior Fellow from 51 to 55. Morris Halley had taken a job teaching languages at MIT, and when Chomsky finishes, along with uh, Morris Halley's help, Chomsky obtains a position uh, at MIT as well, and he 
does a number of things, teaching languages, working on research in the research project of Vic Ingvi. Together with Morris Halley, he sets up a doctoral program at MIT, which begins in 1961, and it attracts some really smart students, uh, smart and enthusiastic and energetic students from across the country and some from overseas as well. The program continues. Chomsky's professional star rises quickly on the basis primarily of, of two books, a small 1957 book called Syntactic Structures and a larger thematic book published in 1965 called Aspects of the Theory of Syntax. And the theory that he offered in Aspects uh, was one that saw sentences of, as having two structures, one that he called a deep structure and one that he called a surface structure. The deep structure was closer to the structure of the meaning expressed by the sentence. And while one could study surface structure, doing so was pretty pointless if one didn't understand that the surface structure is basically a poor reflection and a derivative reflection of the deep structure mediated by a set of uh, rules called transformations. Now, the generative semanticists, who I've mentioned already, Hash Ross, uh, Jim McCauley, Paul Postel, and George Lakoff, proposed a version of this account in which deep structure was in fact as close to the meaning of a sentence um, as its logical form can be. And if you're not exactly sure what logical form is, uh, don't worry because a lot of people aren't sure exactly what it is and it's something that has to be worked out as one proceeds. And transformations may well be the tool, thought uh, these four people, soon to be known as the gender of semanticist. Transformations might well be the tool that's needed to explore what that deep structure was. So these four people, Hadge, Jim, Paul, and George, thought that they were pulling in the same direction that Chomsky was, but Chomsky didn't view it that way. And at this point in the story, it's useful to introduce a distinction that, that Randy uses that, that comes from the book that I wrote with Jeff Huck, um, and, and Randy uh, acknowledges that. There's basically two ways to study syntax. One is to view syntax as a system that explains distributional questions. Where do words appear in a sentence? What categories of words are there? What kinds of agreement are there? Basically, where do words and parts of words show up in a sentence? The, the alternative is to view it as a mediational system, which is mediating to different structures. And in that second perspective, the mediational perspective, what one is interested in is understanding how surface structure relates to the meaning that it expresses. And these are two very different ways of thinking about the problems of syntax. And I would say that pretty much all syntacticians uh, adopt both questions as important. Now, maybe there are some extremes, maybe there are some people who are really not interested in meaning at all, but I, I'm not sure there really have been any of that sort in any event. Most linguists accept both as important, but the fact is, I would say every linguist chooses the one as the really the most important and the, really the right question to ask, and the other is, is secondary to it. In my opinion, both approaches are, are valid and essential, but most linguists, as I say, probably think that one is more important than the others. Though linguists very rarely say which one it is that they think is, is more important. So Hadge, Jim, Paul, and George set off on a chase for a chase for the gold, prioritizing the mediational view of of language. We can understand language best if we recognize that the deep structure that linguists um, have been groping towards is the logical form of the sentence. Chomsky didn't seem to agree at all, and he rejected all the arguments that they came up with um, for that point of view. So all of this disagreement led to a very disagreeable moment towards in the second half of the 1960s. And by around 1970, people gave up on the disagreements out of simple exhaustion. Did good things come out of it? And was it good thing that came out of it in a scientific sense? That's one of the questions that Randy uh, tries to answer. And the answer has to be at least a qualified yes. Though as Randy shows, part of what was good was that Chomsky integrated the notion of logical form into his conception of language. And that's something that uh, Jeff Huck and I um, established as well in our 1995 book. So Chomsky shifts his position about the importance of the role of logical structure, even though Chomsky being Chomsky, he was never prepared to say so, either in public or I imagine in private. 
And that shift was obviously the result of the work of Hadge and George and, and uh, Paul and Jim. But none of these people, these five people and, and people working around them in their penumbra, so to speak, um, none of these people stopped doing linguistics. And Randy goes on to talk ab about the particular paths that each of the linguists followed after 1970. He's most interested, it seems to me, in George Lakoff's work. And that interest shows up in the subtitle of the book. And he quite reasonably sees uh, George's work as central to the rise of cognitive linguistics, which is what George went on to do following his work on generative semantics in the 1960s. Um, and Noam Chomsky himself continued to develop a series of models and a series of quite different theories, in fact, that continued to attract ling linguists, especially young linguists, to work with them. And that really continues to today when Chomsky is well into his 90s. The generative semanticists, especially during the 60s, seemed to exude a certain ethos, one that was even more evident um, when one didn't uh, focus just on the, the four leaders. Randy tries to give a sense of what it was, and he does, a, I think, a very good job. The ethos began with a sense of fun that came after studying lots of languages and doing a lot of work. The fun could be done by poking not-so-innocent fun at the leading politicians of the day, the, the Richard Nixons and the Henry Kissingers, who served to take the pratfalls um, of the example sentences generated by the generative semanticists. And sometimes the fun came along with a disarming honesty when the author acknowledges not having uh, really solved the problems that they started off to solve. Chomsky continued to develop his own approaches a bit during the 1970s uh, when he continued to ask what his system would look like if there were very few transformations in each language, perhaps just even one. And if one, then surely it was going to be the same in every language, like maybe just move, that could be the rule. That was a proposal made by, um, made in Chomsky class one day by Mark Liberman, I remember being there. By the end of the 1970s, Chomsky had rolled out what he called principles and parameters and a division of syntax into semi-autonomous domains like an account of the way thematic roles are assigned, things like um, agent and patient and, and the like, an assign of the, uh, assignment of these uh, uh, thematic roles, an assignment of abstract case, exploring an I idea that began with Dorothy Siegel and Jean-Roger Vignon, and of constraints on movement that were expressed over representations using traces. And while Chomsky was exploring these uh, reconstructions of grammatical theory, other linguists were uh, st sticking clear, uh, sticking closer to the familiar, or in any event, it seems to me clear, including Joan Bresen and Paul Postel and Dave Perlmutter and Ivan Sog and Jeff, Jeff Pullum and Gerald Gazdar. Randy wrote, the appeal of LFG, which was Bresen's model, and GPSG, which was the work of, of uh, such people as Gazdar and Sog and others, was tinged with nostalgia. That's Randy Harris writing this. I don't get that. Their, quote, attempts to preserve certain attractive features of the earlier fra f uh, phases of generative grammar, citing Tom Wasa, hearken back to the mathematical precision and formal rigor of early generative grammar, to the three models and logical structures era. Well, I don't think that's quite right at all. And I remember long discussions of this around 1983, 1984. There were many linguists, um, they were good friends of mine, even one spouse, who were appalled at the hand-waving that they perceived as coming from Chomsky's work. They wanted, rather, to, to work on a model in which, to take one example, clear cases of uh, agreement patterns, for example, which could be found in French or Romanian, uh, could be handled by one and the same theory. You have a theory, it's got to work for all languages. The people working on it weren't at all interested in mathematics or logic or going back to LSLT, which they hadn't read and didn't care about. Um, what they wanted was not a beautiful picture of, picture of language. They wanted a theory which would allow them to do good, descriptive, empirical work, got the facts straight. And Chomsky's picture was beautiful and magnificent, but it didn't allow them to do good scientific work. And that was important. And this, this was the case for a lot of people. We're talking about a lot of linguists at this point. Well, I wrote that, uh, and Randy wrote back and said he wasn't so sure that the two of us disagreed. He said, we seem to be in agreement here, but perhaps the word nostalgia frames it in a way that you find unhelpful, he wrote. 
I'm making no claim that everyone was stampeding to math and logic. I'm just saying that there was a desire for more precision and rigor than was apparent in the approach Chomsky was then advancing. Well, yeah, it was that or it wasn't that. It really was a matter of people who were doing serious linguistic work and they felt that Chomsky's model wasn't developed in such a way that people working as seriously as they were could uh, could have their work integrated into it. That Chomsky was too interested in the big picture, not enough interested in what uh, scientists were finding as they explored real languages. Randy then follows uh, George Lakoff's work into the heart of metaphor in the years after, after this, the 1980s and beyond. As a scholar of rhetoric, uh, Randy, uh, he lets the reader know what he thinks of the work that uh, Lakoff did along with uh, Mark Johnson. He writes, Lakoff and Johnson's scholarship in this matter is disgracefully negligent with the greatest guilt clearly uh, clearly falling on Lakoff, by far the senior scholar and, and the lead author. Pretty strong words. He brings his professional opinions to, to the table. Uh, Randy sees George's engagement with metaphor in the book Metaphors We Live By as, quote, the clearest transmutation of generative semantics into a new and vibrant framework. Well, George, along with other linguists, many of them in California, like Lacan, Lanneker, and uh, Gilles Fauconnier, but many of them were, were elsewhere. Um, George had moved into what he called cognitive grammar, leaning as often as not on models in cognitive psychology, many of which had, a, had their original roots in, in Gestalt psychology. Well, at the point when the book is uh, halfway over, well, only halfway over, uh, well, at page 301 to be precise, so it's a little more than halfway over, um, the story moves into the 21st century and each of the horsemen of generous semantics gets his moment. Macaulay, he writes, in his postbellum work, much more recognizably followed the early generative semantics paths than any other horse folk, right up until he was unfortunately felled by a massive heart attack on the University of Chicago campus in 1999 at the age of 61. Randy sketches a deft picture of the linguist, the person that Macaulay was, willing to engage in disputes with Chomsky, but never showing any irritation at being misrepresented by him or anything else for that matter. He was in some respects a lot like uh, Charles Chuck Fillmore. Um, Jim was a working grammarian, both pleased and proud to be uncovering the mysteries of English or Spanish or Mandarin or Korean. Randy offers a sympathetic account of Hadge Ross's personal trajectory after the rocky years that were the linguistic wars, a trajectory that took him into the heart of poetry in Hadge's case in a way that he said was originally shown to him when he was a student by Roman Jakobsen. Hadge was indelibly the student of, of three linguists, of uh, first of Zelig Harris and of Noam Chomsky and of Roman Jakobsen. And he tried to bring, he has tried to bring the ideas of all three linguists together, all of these three very different linguistic souls, to bring them together into one way of looking at language. That's probably a superhuman task, but Hedge is a superhuman. And um, he's made a really good run for his money. At times, I think it's fair to say that Hedge has worried that by not creating or developing a framework or a theory, he was condemning his work to the margins of linguistics. But his work, which appeared less and less often in written form over the decades, it's always been brutal in its honesty about what he's found with his own methods of exploration. Paul Postel is harder to characterize. I said that I know him less well. One of Paul's ideas that Randy tries to explain is the idea that natural languages are abstractions in the same domain as mathematical objects, a notion which is very, very far away from the view that is very, very standard today, almost universally espoused by linguists, um, that grammar is a cognitive faculty of some sort. This is discussed around page 312 of, of Randy's book. Now, I'm not at all sure that Randy gets Postal's perspective, but I'm not sure how many linguists do. And, and Randy 
doesn't agree with me, doesn't seem to agree with me that he doesn't get Postel's perspective. I think that Postel's view is best understood in the context of 19th century mathematics and, and philosophy. There was, um, there was a conflict in the 19th century, and this is something that Bernard Lax and I discuss in our recent book, Battle in the Minefields. There, was, there were two sides to uh, a dispute which was often described as psychologism versus anti-psychologism. And the psychologism position was that psychology was the science upon which other disciplines would rest, and those disciplines would include logic, for example, and grammar, and other disciplines that had to do with thought or the mind. And uh, John Stuart Mill is often taken to be the central character in this approach. And this was rejected by others, notably by Bolzano, um, it, it comes out really clear, well, Frege is another person who rejected it uh, very strongly, it comes out very clearly in the professional trajectory of, um, of uh, Husserl, the, the philosopher, uh, who began in the psychologism category, and after some strong criticisms from Frege in Husserl's second book, Logical Investigations, Begins, begins a very, very strong defense of the anti-psychologism position. Anyway, the, the anti-psychologism position is that talking about the objects of the mind, especially in logic and mathematics, and we can extend this to grammar, this is Postal's perspective, it seems to me, um, the objects of these studies are not psychological objects, but they're abstract objects in the same way the mathematical objects are. Anyway. Uh, that's a dis for a discussion, much larger discussion. Rainey uh, presents two other developments with considerable enthusiasm. One is Ray Jackendoff's work over the last 30 years, um, which has shown, is always shown, a, a kind of a big-hearted willingness to accept ideas from other linguists regardless of what, uh, what their ideologies are, what camps they happen to be associated with. And Rainey's also been very interested in, in cognitive grammar, and in particular construction grammar. And he, he cites Adele Goldberg's work, um, the, the, which comes in for a special mention in, uh, in his survey of where linguistics is going. All of this is very interesting, but the, the best part of Randy's book, really, the best part uh, is, is the last 35 pages or so. It's the last chapter. Uh, and he tries to put the pieces together and try, he tries to do the best he can to explain who this character, Noam Chomsky, is. He talks us through Noam's humanity, the way in which he's a normal guy who plays video games with his grandchildren. And I have to say, I think, you know, I didn't mention it before, I said Chomsky was my teacher, he was on my dissertation committee, and I interacted with him, and I have to say, he, he, he was an extremely generous person, generous with the, the most important uh, quantity that any of us have to share, and that's with his, his time, is a very generous person towards his students, of which something that I saw. And this is an important part of known. There's, there's no question of that. And then Randy turns to one important, well, you know, we could say an essential aspect of his personality, from which many other things flow that are really important as well. And that is his dead certain conviction that he's right. His certainty that he knows the truth. And with that, alas, seems to come an inability to imagine that someone else can legitimately see things differently and, and still be right and not be wrong. So Randy goes into survey, both the positive and the negative sides of, of Noam Chomsky. And summarizing at one point, he, he writes this. He says, how can someone who is so utterly sincere also be so utterly reckless with facts, and especially with the reputations of others, that it becomes indistinguishable from malice? And let's not forget, he's not a stupid man. Does he not see what he's doing? Unfortunately, it's virtually impossible to raise the embarrassment of this paradox 
without immediately contributing to the polarization. That's the end of the quote from Randy. Randy expounds on this and, and he says, I now come down more on the side of reckless negligence than on the side of calculated deceit. Unreliability with the truth certainly does not give Chomsky a halo. And I'm not saying there aren't gray areas, but neither does it fit him for horns. And Randy concludes the Chomsky quote now, has, in other words, one, a hermeneutic disorder, and two, uh, an exp expressive disorder. On the first count, this is this hermeneutic disorder, he apparently cannot read or listen openly. And on the second, he is apparently unaware, or just doesn't care, that his own sometimes idiosyncratic meanings are not shared by all. Both problems would seem to follow from that blinding arrogance. Now, many pages follow in, in which Randy uh, looks at Chomsky's blistering responses to people who he takes to be attacking him when it's hard to see why, why Chomsky works so hard to misrepresent others' position, positions, and he lets fly with what Randy and, and, and I, and doubtless you if you look into it, see as unwarranted hostility. And Randy does it in about as kindly, well, and respectful a fashion as I can imagine. He really carries his respect for Chomsky, even through the moments when it's hard to feel sympathy for him, for Chomsky. And I've tried, but I've failed to pull out some sentences from what Randy wrote to give you a sense of how he does that. Uh, it's really in the balance that he, he that Randy succeeds, I think. He, he makes a really, I think, honest effort to show both the positive and the negative and try to figure out how a single person can be both. And that's really the, the interesting puzzle that lies behind all of this. Pulling a few sentences out of context just doesn't do it because, as they say, the, the balance is really what it's all about. So I think... You should read this book, and you know what? Maybe you should read the last chapter first, this book, this chapter uh, on who Noam Chomsky is. You don't have to read it first, but if you're not sure you're going to get all the way to the end, believe me, you should read it. So maybe you should read it first and then go on and read the rest of the book, which in a certain sense is what it's all leading up to. And it's leading up to Randy's answer to the question, who is Noam Chomsky? I'm going to draw this video to a close. As I said at the beginning, I've just finished writing a review, and I wrote that review for the History and Philosophy of the Language Sciences, and you can find the review through their web presence at highphillangsci.net, if I'm not mistaken. You can also find it just by Googling on me, just uh, you know, Google on John Goldsmith homepage. You'll, uh, it'll bring it to my homepage. Um, and uh, there you go. I recommend uh, that you read this book. I also recommend that you read Battle in the Minefields by Bill Lax and, and myself. See you next time.